Thank you very much for inviting me. This is my first chance of being in Eskild tonight and I'm broadening my horizons. So hopefully I can broaden your horizons a little bit about what I'm working on. And what I'm working on is this, the big picture. I'm a computational neuroscientist who ended up in the philosophy department of Oxford University uh, because I couldn't keep to my topic. My advisor got many, many gray hairs for me, not doing anything about brains or memory, but running off uh, and studying a little bit about neural implants, and, uh, well, that's all right, uh, a little bit about ethics, no, that doesn't sound very useful, and then writing papers about the future. And then I ended up in the philosophy department, so uh, this is how it can go badly. <laughs> and what I'm doing in the philosophy department of Oxford is working at the Future of Humanity Institute. And we got this lovely remit. We're supposed to look at the big picture, the long-range future of humanity. Not just the next 10 years, but questions about, well, where will we be in the next hundred? Or thousand or million? Or actually a trillion years? I'm actually working on a paper about that. It turns <laughs> out that the expansion of the universe does have some nasty economic and ethical implications. <laughs> But also, there are interesting questions about the threats and possibilities. What can we do with them? And how can we understand them better? So a lot of our research is about applied rationality, figuring out what's going on here. And this is where philosophers turn out to be surprisingly useful, because they get into these areas where there are no rules and try to figure out how to actually think carefully about them. After a few hundred years of mistakes and rather embarrassing papers, eventually somebody gets their act together and it moves out and becomes its own department with nice funding and everybody says, yeah, yeah, what has philosophy ever achieved? Look at economics, natural science, history, psychology. Yeah, economics and uh, all those ones are useful. Philosophy part never seemed to do anything. Well, hopefully we're doing something here. So I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about a first question. Well, why, what is the purpose of technology? And it's pretty obvious actually what it is, magic. <laughs> Uh, that is actually what we want uh, to do. And here is a quote from a bona fide ceremonial magician, the slightly famous Alice de Crave. This is his definition of magic. The, art, uh, the science and art of causing change in conformance with will. And when we think about what we want our technology to do, is to get us what we want. Ideally, of course, in a very easy and convenient way, but the typical view in fairy tales of magic is that if you wish for something, and wish in the right way, even use uh, with fairy godmothers or wishing wells or uh, something like that, you will get it. That is really what we want our technology to be like. We don't want uh, just loose wishes to immediately turn real. That's kind of uh, bad design. And we don't want it to be too hard. And we might even put, want to put in some limitations on it. But we certainly want to get this system uh, working and actually create a fairy tale world. Uh, we actually want uh, uh, to create uh, uh, something uh, a lot like our stories. And this is, of course, the enchanted forest we have achieved. And this is actually a very strange place. If we went back sufficiently far into history and asked our ancestors what they wished for, we would say, oh yes, I want a world where I don't have to do backbreaking work all day to stay alive, and food should be really easy to available. Ideally, look, uh, food with lots of fat and sugar and salt. Mmm, that's yummy, that's yummy. And I don't want to uh, get sick, and I want to live uh, to a really ripe old age. And I think we have achieved that, to some degree, quite well. We might also notice that we might be a bit should be a bit careful about what we wish for. Sometimes we do get it and realize, hmm, there are some problems here. Again, of course, the fairy tales uh, uh, point this out. And then usually get to the more that things should stay the same, because that's the right thing. I think we can demonstrate, actually, that no, th some things should change. And actually, they are changing at an enormous rate. So we're living in the Anthropocene. Uh, some of you might know about these geological ages. And uh, there is an idea that uh, we have left the Holocene and entered a new geological era, because the dominant geological force on Earth is no longer the normal form of erosion and uh, by the activity of the biosphere, but actually humans. We are actually in a... I think the major factor causing erosion of rock right now. And humanity is fixating 190 million tons of nitrogen every year, which is about as much as the rest of the biosphere together. We're changing the geology of the planet on an enormous rate, sometimes, not, of course, not for the better. But quite a lot of it is to our benefit. 
We're the most common large mammal on the planet, and we can be found everywhere. Actually, the total human biomass is simply in a staggering. Uh, we're, in a, we're outweighing most other in the big mammals, except, of course, for our domestic uh, animals. In fact, we're creating a kind of domesticated world. Uh, today, only 10% of the non-frozen land area of Earth is more than 48 hours away from the nearest big city. Hmm. It's actually not that much wilderness left. And uh, that means that we need to think about how we care about our uh, planet, of course. And I could launch into the standard speed here about uh, the climate change, etc. But, uh, well, I'm rather optimistic. I'm more interested in how can we learn to be better at this? And where does robots come into this? Well, obviously, we uh, want uh, that change uh, to happen according to our intentions. But our intentions are very muddled, and we're not always around to do these intentions. So sometimes we need some, somebody else or something else to do what we want. We also need uh, to spread widely around. There might also be that we like to have company. There is a reason why so many robots are interesting and cute, because we also are very good at thinking socially. A lot of our brain is actually dealing with the kind of ongoing soap opera of uh, human relationships. And that is important because we use that to understand physics too. We understand a lot of the world in social terms. So by actually adding a little bit of autonomy to our devices, we might make them easier to manage. And of course, we create the talking animals for that enchanted forest. Okay, what are the trends that are affecting us right now? Well, here is a bunch. I'm going to jump past them uh, <coughs> relatively quickly because most of them, of course, are fairly well known. Uh, generally, we are having a bigger population. We get a few kids, so we're aging rather quickly. Most people live in cities. They might range from very nice ones to the rather nasty ones. Uh, we are actually getting richer, and uh, even uh, the poorest ones. It's just that, uh, of course, we might be discussing the differences here. The world is definitely getting very globalized. It's not just that we're running out of resource, we're also reusing and reinventing what we're using resource for. So suddenly rare earths are in a, a big political issue and people realize that, hmm, copper, well that's nice, but fiber optics is better. And we need to deal with what we have inadvertently added and links, created links between our social systems and our technological system and the climate systems in ways we don't really intend that. Oops. But it happens all the time. Similarly, society is changing in a lot of interesting ways. Uh, of course, uh, it's uh, also popular to be scared these days, so we might worry about our security. We need more, much more education, and well, that's a problem because if we're getting educated uh, well enough, we're too old to work eventually. And all this change, all this globalization, all these links forces us to renegotiate a lot of our ideas. What about surveillance and privacy? Oh, the old norms have to be changing because we have got cell phones and uh, cameras everywhere. I have uh, a uh, surveillance camera every 18 meters between my home and my office in Oxford. And it's coming to Sweden too. It, even though it might not be the official uh, cameras, it might be people's cell phone cameras. And then of course we have a democratization. People actually demanding much more control over their lives. But most importantly of course, at least for this audience, is that technology is doing an awful lot of uh, fun stuff. We're having a lot of technologies, not just computers, but they are accelerating. Uh, not all of them fast enough. Japanese beer is getting exponentially cheaper, but at a fairly slow rate, uh, which is maybe a bit sad if you happen to like uh, Sapporo beer. Uh, we're getting an enormous amounts of data that we can manipulate. Uh, we're getting smart into practically everything. There are wireless connections in more and more things, and as we get cheap plastic electronics and uh, uh, low-power electronics, it's getting more and more sensible to add it to anything, which of course means that they can do surveillance. And uh, as I'm going to return to, a lot of them are actually going to be robot ready. There are actually already sensors and actuators that you could use for robotic applications. And we like to automate things because it makes things cheaper and more efficiently, and humans are actually quite expensive. And we want to adjust it. Okay, where does that lead us? Let me give you a few examples here and uh, look at the health, obviously. When, uh, we're needing a lot more health because we're getting older and pe uh, people are going to be having various chronic diseases for a long time. It's also getting more expensive. People are pro proposed, for example, telemedicine, where you can use lab on a chip to make uh, tests that previously would have required a trip to the hospital lab in order to do it in the home. In the long run, we might be seeing that people get various robotic automation to help them in the home, like we saw in that early video. But uh, right now, it's probably mostly communication. 
but it's actually important to try to automate medicine as much as possible. So speaking as somebody in the philosophy department, I would say we have a moral obligation to make more medical robots. It's not just that it would be good business. It's actually something we ought to be doing quite strongly. Why? It's not just because it's expensive uh, uh, to, for, to healthcare costs. It's also very important uh, in order to distribute it to the poor people. Typically, gadgets tend to come down exponentially price over time. We learn how to produce them cheaply, and, uh, and we develop uh, better tools for it. Services tend to remain at the same price, because you need to pay that doctor, that nurse, uh, those uh, people who are actually running the hospital. OK, so how can we fix that? Well, what if we turn medicine into a gadget? Of course, it's pretty hard to do everything in medicine as a gadget. We can't really all go around with these Da Vinci surgical robots at our home, mostly because we don't need surgery all the time, fortunately. <laughs> of course, if it was sufficiently good, maybe we would be using surgery all the time, because it would be so fun. Yeah. <laughs> but everything we could automate in medicine and turn into gadgets would actually be morally a good thing, because now we could distribute it eventually and across the world much more efficiently. Uh, this is, of course, an interesting example also that something that's morally good and economically good might still be very hard to implement because there are going to be a lot of doctors, patients, and politicians who have very strong views on how medicine is done. And our medical systems are integrated social organizations which are very resilient to any change. Any young doctor can tell you that there are plenty of nice tools that uh, are just lying around because the older doctors don't use them and look <coughs> slightly down on the, the young doctors who use them. So we might want to figure out ways around that. Or maybe it's in the emerging market that the real revolution is going to happen because we haven't been stuck with the, the, this kind of an old social system. So maybe the robot nurses are going to be the Chinese robot nurses. Not the Japanese, because uh, the Japanese hospital have had too long time to get, become set in their ways about what a robot nurse should be. Meanwhile, the, the real future might be happening when you get the, the robot nurse hackers uh, down somewhere in Sichuan coming up with the really cheap robot nurse. Another interesting area is telepresence. Okay, climate is changing. We should uh, all feel very bad for uh, going on the long airline flights, but we're also getting globalized and we want to meet each other. Uh, we have our social needs and uh, Skype conversations don't really cut it in many situations. Sometimes you actually want to act. So people have been starting to look beyond the normal video conference. Maybe we <coughs> should uh, put our head on a Segway and uh, use that to kind of move around the offices somewhere abroad. It's obviously fairly primitive. But I think given that there is a very <coughs> fundamental social need and a very important dilemma here about travel, I think telepresence might be something that's going to come quite a lot in the future. If it does, and again it depends on whether you can convince people that coming as a telepresence uh, device rather than in person is the right social thing, and this has a lot to do with marketing rather than engineering. Um, in that case, I think we're going to end up with a lot of these ones, which are essentially robots. So when I'm not using uh, the telepresence rig, why not use it as a robot? Or vice versa. In a world where there's plenty of robots around, we already have telepresence equipment. And a lot of these systems are going to be linked to, together with uh, the normal devices. This one is, after all, mainly laptops and standard equipment. What if we could use our cell phones and plug them in somewhere and use that for telepresence? All right, and then of course we have a smart cars. Again, this is probably going to be one of the amazing success stories of robotics. It's, uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge has been uh, doing the rounds. Google is lobbying in the Nevada, I think, to change the rules for unmanned vehicles. And again, the problem is no longer really technical. It's legal and social. Do we trust cars that have no drivers? Especially do we trust them on the roads when the little old ladies are also drivers? And the traffic lights break down. One interesting problem, for example, with traffic lights is that the car is supposed to obey them. But there are plenty of red lights around on the road, from other cars, from uh, stores, and sometimes traffic lights appear in unexpected places. Or they're broken. So what is the smart car supposed to do? Maybe we could mandate that all traffic lights should be sending out a Wi-Fi signal about their state. Or maybe we should say, yeah, let's have a very detailed map and load that into where all the traffic lights are. So the car can figure out where to look for red spot. Or we should say, oh, let's make it really, really smart. My argument would be that mm. all these are nice, but they don't really work always. If you combine them, of course, you get something more robust. 
And that is really the problem that we need to deal with. Something that works in this human created world needs to be robust. It needs to be able to handle surprises and it also needs to be transparent enough or trustworthy enough that humans can handle it. And it also needs to fail gracefully. We don't want cars to not fail gracefully when they get confused. It might be one thing if a computer during a presentation fails, okay? But on the other hand, cars are a little bit too dangerous. And this is really what's probably going to be the main hindrance for making smart cars, actually making them trustworthy. Generally, we kind of come up with all sorts of weird ideas uh, from uh, our toys. So these are quadcopter and uh, bots. So, so over here is from the Grasp Lab at the University of Pennsylvania, I think, where we are doing some amazing aerial acrobatics uh, using swarm algorithms, uh, etc. And uh, they have been used uh, to build stuff. Uh, you, you, know, you can test out uh, using them for surveillance. And of course, this is kind of mini version of the military drones where you have a lot of money in, uh, going into something that is going to lead to a lot of civilian applications. <laughs> but these kind of devices, of course, come from the toy industry, really. Thanks to the gadgets we developed, uh, which have the low power electronics and better batteries, to accelerometers, etc., it has become possible to build fairly cheap toys that you control from your smartphone. And it's, of course, fairly easy for amateurs to add a little camera, and suddenly they have a drone. And suddenly, by adding your little standard camera to the toy you bought, you have something that is against the ITAR agreement about diffusion of technology. And at least according to American laws, that's a very serious uh, military hardware. And this one is actually the Occupy bot. There is part of the Occupy movement now. who are developing, indeed, surveillance drones to, in order to check on police. They're interested because they have multiple contracts. Several people are controlling them. So if the police nabs one of them, the drone will still be transmitting live on the internet and will not go out of control. So here we see another area. Robotics has traditionally been a kind of high threshold, expensive activity. But we're now getting to the world where you also have the inexpensive robots that you can play around with, where you can open source things, where people can share experiences and ideas online. This is going to put the pressure from the below on the robotics industry, of course. If you're not good enough, then you can be replaced by something you get for free in, uh, from the open source community or fab at home. And it also is going to produce a lot of interesting ideas. Many industries have realized that customers are, of course, the best designers and researchers they could possibly get. So that's going to lead to a lot of changes. Of course, one interesting problem to conclude with is the problem of autonomy. Well, things misbehave or go wrong. And how much smart do we want to have? It actually turns out to be a rather subtle question. A normal tool, like a fork or a knife, is directly under my control. If something goes bad, it's because of me. Uh, and then, of course, we can add a little bit of autonomy, so it does something on its own. And suddenly, it's much less safe, because now it might do doing something unexpected. As we build smarter and smarter tools, they generally tend to become safer. We, we can build in safety in uh, systems. The really interesting things which we are doing research on and we can't really talk about here right now, but come to our conference in December about it, is we question what happens when you reach really high levels of intelligence. There are some reasons why you might be very scared of that, about very smart systems. The real problem is that stupid systems, they misbehave because we cannot explain our intentions to them. Smarter systems misbehave and, uh, because, uh, well, partially uh, we misunderstand each other. We don't get what the car wants. The car doesn't understand our traffic light. The really smart ones have different motivations. So we want to design things uh, uh, to have different levels of intelligence for different <coughs> purposes because we want to optimize things. So leading to my conclusions here, generally it seems that the world is becoming robot-enabled, partially because we're living in the Anthropocene, but that's also a, he a heck of a problem for the poor robots because they need to understand us. And we're complicated, weird creatures who have a very complicated social understanding. We tend to assume that everything that is playing a part in our social world understands all the weird rules. And then, of course, the problem is that we also setting our priorities may be a bit wrong. There are a lot of important things we're not focusing well enough. But we're getting it so cheap now to actually do this. So in general, creating robust robots that are just smart enough, an ecosystem. That's going to give us the talking animals for enchanted forest and hopefully some genius for our wishes. And it's hopefully going to make the Anthropocene a really nice period to live in. Thank you.